Development of Leopard 1 started in 1956, with the vehicle entering service in 1965. This proved to be a bit of a change in German tank design philosophy when compared to the previous entries, such as Panther and King Tiger. Uh, they had a heavy emphasis on armour protection as well as the gun. Well, when they came up with Leopard, they decided that there wasn't really much point in trying to create enough armour to defend against whatever was coming at it. The theory was that no matter what was uh, being fired, it would go through. As a result, the requirements for armour protection were very light. What was more important was mobility, and the gun would be nice. Uh, so what they came up with, they developed a system using the British L7 105mm cannon, excellent gun. They mated it with an MTU 37.4 litre diesel, put that onto torsion bar suspension, and basically turned that into their tank. Initial version of Leopard 1 started off with a simple cast turret on the welded hull. Crew of four, driver at the front right of the hull, to his left would be stowed ammunition. Behind him in the crew compartment you're going to have the standard commander and gunner on the right and loader on the left. There are 55 rounds of 105mm ammunition stowed on the vehicle, 13 ready and uh, the other 42 were scattered around. The fire control system was relatively simple. It did have a coincidence range finder. Those are the two little blisters on each side of the turret. And the stite was semi-stabilized. You couldn't really shoot on the move, but it was good enough, kind of like a gyro stabilizer almost in the, uh, the American tanks in World War II, to keep the target in the sight so that on a short halt, you had a very, very fast engagement time. Driver's compartment controls are fairly simple. To his front, he has basically a steering wheel, two pedals, for the brake and the accelerator, and there is a semi-automatic gearbox, uh, the handle for which is located on the front right. Also behind him on the floor is located the escape hatch. Uh, if the turret is turned the correct way around, all four crew members can escape through the belly of the vehicle. The suspension is torsion bar, common to many tanks of the era. The engine in the back is a complete power pack system, with the drive sprocket also being at the rear. Leopard 1's signifying feature are the large radiator grills on the flanks. On the front of the vehicle you see a whole lot of little X tiles. Now this is, uh, this is a clever little thing, it's snow grousers. For something with rubber tracks like let's say the M60, what you'd have to do is turn a center guide inside out and you would use that as a sort of a snow tread. It worked fine in snow but as soon as you went on something solid you were basically destroying the road and your center guides. What you could do with this leopard track though, and you'll also see it in some other German vehicles, is you could remove the individual track pads, maybe one every tenth link, and replace it with this X tile. This gave you snow traction that didn't destroy the roads or anything else. Very clever idea. We only implemented this idea on Abrams when we finally introduced our own separate pad tracks. The cleats do exist. I've personally never seen one, but they are the manual. Left hand side of the turret you're going to see a little pistol port. Uh, this is also used primarily really for easy loading of ammunition. Uh, so you don't have to load the round all the way up through the back deck into the turret roof, down through the hatch, you can simply pass it through the side and the loader can easily access and stow it. A neat feature about most German tanks uh, and APCs is that they're basically street legal. You have wing mirrors, you have turn signals and a lot of times you have uh, license plates. The vehicle behind is technically a Leopard 1A1A2. Now you start off with your basic Leopard 1. Uh, the next thing you do is you add additional armor. So this has, uh, you can see on the turret front and on the mantlet, an extra layer of armor to defend against more recent ammunition types. They are mounted on rubber blocks, giving a spaced effect as well. You can see those further back on the turret. The next upgrade to make it a 1A1A2 was upon the introduction in service of Leopard 2 with the thermal imager, earlier Leopard 2s, which had a low light television system uh, installed, they had the camera for that removed and it is mounted on the front right of the turret on the mantlet in the little cage. So the camera has been removed from this particular vehicle but the cage indicates where it would have been. And this was a passive uh, image intensifier system. Not a thermal imager, not as good, but definitely a vast improvement over the active infrared system that had been used previously. Inside the tank, uh, loader has a fair bit of room on the left hand side to service the 105 cannon. 
There is a coaxial MG3 7.62mm machine gun as well. Some users changed that out to an FN mag, American Service DM240. Commander also had an MG3 of his own up uh, by the cupola. On the commander's side, at his feet is the gunner, well equipped with all the controls you would expect for both powered or manual engagements. He has both the primary sight through the periscope and a direct vision sight through the mantlet. The gun tubes are equipped with a thermal sleeve. And what this does is it equalizes the temperature of the gun tube so that as it heats up or cools down, it expands or contracts at an equal rate. Otherwise, for example, let's say you had a nice hot sunny day, you fire a few rounds, the gun tube expands, then it starts to drizzle. It rains on top of the gun tube. This will cool the metal on the top of the gun. The metal will contract. This will then warp the gun to aim upwards. As a result, the thermal shroud will stop this from happening. Plus, on a lot of guns, you will also find a muzzle bore sight device. And this gives you a point of reference to use to make sure that your gun is actually pointing where you think it is. The commander is equipped with his own little independent periscope. It is unstabilized, but does allow him to perform a, something of a hunter-killer role. A hunter-killer system is where the commander identifies the target through his own optic and is able to slew the gunner onto the target directly. In addition to his periscope, he is equipped with a number of uh, individual periscopes around his own cupola. And of course, he has his own commander's control handle. In a nice nod to creature comfort, the side skirts, which are actually more of a flexible rubber than they are metal, uh, they're really more designed to keep the dust down than they are to provide ballistic protection. But the side skirts have little footholds cut in them, so it makes getting on and off this tank very simple. The track itself is the dual pin type, basically a deal system. Uh, it's been used by the Germans pretty much since uh, the Leopard 1 came about, and it's still that basic design is in service today. Of course, there are multiple versions of the Leopard 1, and it's not the only one here. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to have a look at an A4. Leopard 1 was built in batches. Of the fifth batch built for the German Army, 110 came out with a new turret design. This was a welded boxy structure as opposed to the original cast. Now, the advantage of this was it had more internal volume and you didn't sacrifice really any protection. The A3 was this variant. The A4 followed subsequently thereafter. The external visual distinguisher is going to be the commander's periscope. On the A3, it's a very simple little tubular thing. On the A4, it is a fully stabilized panoramic periscope. The vehicle behind me is an A4. Now, it is still fundamentally st the same tank. Uh, we still have the same 870 horsepower engine. You still have the same coincidence rangefinder system. You still have the same 105 millimeter cannon, the British L7. However, the A4 did add a fully stabilized integrated fire control system, as opposed to the more semi-stabilized system on the earlier tanks. However, we also retain the same searchlight box housing on top of the gun mantlet, which was infrared or white light selectable. The increased fire control capability did come at a cost. The computers took up a lot more room inside the tank than was earlier the case. So even though we now have the increased volume of the welded turret, the interior space available to the crew is actually fairly similar, if not slightly worse, than that on the cast turret vehicles. The last Leopard 1s were built for the German army in 1979, although they reopened the production line again in 1981 for the Greeks. The vehicle saw widespread service. If you weren't building and designing your own tanks, such as the British or the French, and if you weren't getting free tanks from the Americans through foreign military aid, and you had to pay money to buy a tank, the chances are that you bought a Leopard. So widely exported, it was known often as the Euro tank. The vehicle was subjected to a whole bunch of upgrade programs and is still in service today in a number of countries.